Well, good morning, Grace Church. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Uh, there's, there's been this trend going around on TikTok and other social media platforms uh, that ask the question, is there a song that can summon an entire generation? So it's been really fun to watch people's responses to that. Uh, and it's had me thinking about how songs are just ingrained in us. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a little audience participation to see how deeply music is ingrained in you. So I'm gonna read a lyric line. I'm gonna try really hard not to read it in sync with the melody uh, and see if you can finish the, the line. Some of these are a lot easier than others. Let's see how you do. First one, go on, go, walk out the door, turn around now, you're not welcome anymore. You're the one who tried to hurt me with goodbye, think I'd crumble, you'd think I'd lay down and die. Oh no, not I, I. All right, pretty good. All right, if I should stay, I would only be in your way, so I'll go, but I know I'll think of you every step of the way, and I will always love you, yes. All right, how about this one? Do you remember the 21st night of? All right, all right. Uh, wise men say only fools rush in, but I can't help. All right, we are, this one's a little newer. We are never, ever, ever getting back together just a small town girl living in a lonely world been working so hard I'm punching my card eight hours for what oh tell me what I got I've got this feeling that time's just holding me down I'll hit the ceiling or else I'll tear up this town so now I gotta cut loose Foot loose. All right, you, you did pretty good. And I get the irony of that last one being from a movie that's known about a preacher telling a bunch of people that they weren't allowed to dance. I get it. But music is a universal language. It always amazes me that I can remember the lyrics to a song that I heard one time 20 years ago, but I can't remember to take out the garbage. And I know it amazes my wife too. There's something though about a good playlist that can alter our mood, can get us through the day. Uh, my playlist of choice lately has been one called Breezy Summer Classics, and, and it's good, but I've also got a playlist for sitting around a campfire, one called Grillin' and Chillin', one for car rides, a couple of different worship playlists. And in the same way, the songs of our faith help us remember who we are and whose we are. Let me say that again. The songs of our faith remind us who we are and whose we are. Karl Barth was a Swiss theologian. He was probably the greatest uh, philosopher and theologian of his time. Uh, during his life, he published more than 600 books, articles, essays, and commentaries. And probably what's his most well-known work is called Church Dogmatics. And I had to read a lot of it in seminary. It's over 9,000 pages, 13 volumes long. It's one of the foundational texts for 20th century Christian thought. Really smart guy. At the end of his life, he was lecturing at a seminary in the United States, and there was a question and answer period. And one of the students asked something like this, Dr. Barth, what is the greatest truth you've ever learned in your years of studying and writing? All of the students were sitting on the edge of their seats. They're, they're waiting for some great, profound, deep, complicated answer. Remember, Church Dogmatics is 9,000 pages. Dr. Barth slowly raised his head. He looked directly at the student and he said this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That was the greatest thing he'd ever learned. And most of us learned that song in Sunday school somewhere along the way. It's one of the first songs I remember learning. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that was the best thing he'd ever learned. That's why in this series, Summer Playlist, you're gonna hear from, from, from several different pastors regarding a song or hymn that's personally meaningful to each one of us, which is a good spot for me to stop and say, I know one of the adjustments y'all have had to make uh, over the past year is this idea of sharing your pastor with the other campuses. You see, I'm not just the pastor of Central Campus, I'm a pastor of Grace Church. And this means that there are times that I have responsibilities at the other campuses. And this is one of those months that we're all rotating around, sharing our messages across all three campuses. 
doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I'm going anywhere. Doesn't mean I don't like Central Campus. In fact, the opposite's quite true. But the exciting thing is that in this series, uh, with the pastor sharing songs that impact them, you're also gonna get to hear from Pastor Taylor Foley and Pastor Taylor Brown. And I'm really excited for you to get to worship with them this month. And, and we're hoping that by sharing some of our favorites, it's gonna bolster all of our collective faith and allow the music that we hear on Sunday mornings and we hear other places to be a tool that God uses to uplift us, to inspire us, to connect us to him and to one another. We want you to start building your own playlist and maybe some of these songs will make it onto yours too. So before we dive into the song that I've selected, I, I want to help us understand the significance of music in our, our, our shared history as the Methodist movement. John and Charles Wesley, the brothers who founded Methodism, they, they recognized the impact of music on worship and spiritual growth. Charles alone wrote over 6,000 hymns. 6,000. Most of them are unsingable, but it was a good try. Uh, a lot of them we do still sing today in, in traditional uh, services. And these hymns were not just songs, they were sermons set to music. They were meant to, to teach theology, to teach our faith, to inspire devotion to Jesus. The Wesley brothers believed that music could reach people in ways that the spoken word could not. Their hymns were meant to be accessible and memorable, rich in biblical truth, and, and, and they were meant to be ways to make complex theological issues easier to understand and internalize. Who's ever sat on a Sunday morning and went, man, that song was good, but I have no idea what Pastor Larry's talking about. Sometimes I'm the one thinking that myself. Uh, the, the, the emphasis on hymn singing, on, on singing and music and worship, it was a hallmark of the Methodist movement. And that's really a huge part of the movement's growth and vitality. This is our heritage, Grace Church. And I'm unapologetically a follower of Jesus in that Wesleyan stream. So I knew when we found out this was the series we were going to do that I wanted to teach on one of our Wesleyan hymns. And I went and I started looking at my favorites. And can it be? That doesn't really work at Central. Love divine, all love's excelling. No, uh, Christ the Lord is risen today. We probably know that one. Uh, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Come thou long expected Jesus. Or we could have gone all the way to Christmas because it's so stinking hot outside. Maybe it'd make us feel better to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. All of those are written by Charles Wesley. At the end of the day, it was, it was too hard of a decision for me. So I ended up going with a song that's based, that isn't one of Charles Wesley's hymns, but it's based on a prayer of our Wesleyan tradition. The song is called Wesley Prayer, and it's by a band called Bristol House from Texas. Uh, and it's based on what we call the covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. And we usually pray this at the first service of a new year. And the song is a prayer of total surrender and commitment to God. It's a, it's a powerful song in my own life that has called, called me to offer myself fully to God, allowing him to work in me and through me. Uh, it's grounded in Romans chapter 12, verses one through two, where Paul writes this. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's what this prayer is based on. So for the rest of our time today, we're gonna to look at the verses of Wesley prayer and how they echo what we just read in Romans 12. As a prayer of dedication, as a cry for God's refining fire to purify us and make us holy and completely his. So here's the first verse. I am yours, no longer my own. Put me to whatever you will. Place me with whomever you choose. I am yours and you are mine. It, right out of the gate, this song doesn't, doesn't take any time to warm up. Right out of the gate, it's a declaration of belonging to God. It's an affirmation that if we follow Jesus, we no longer belong to ourselves, but we're meant to be wholly his. And that aligns beautifully with what Paul wrote in that first verse, where we're all urged to offer our bodies as living sacrifices of worship. Let's hear it again. And so, dear brothers and sisters, 
I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Then what? This is truly the way to worship him. He said, because of all that God has done for me, the best gift of worship that I can give in return is me. All of me. Put me where you want me to be. Place me with the people you want me to be with. I am yours. The commitment to be placed wherever God chooses emphasizes our trust in God's call on our lives. That, that his call, his plan is always, always, always better than what we could plan for ourselves. And now this isn't one of those God has a plan and you don't have a choice kind of messages. In the song, in the prayer, in Paul's plea to the Christians living in Rome, it's clear that we choose whether or not to participate in God's plan. God's plans are good and right and holy, but we're not forced. We get to choose. And it doesn't mean that God's call and God's plan are always, per, are always easy either. It just means they're better. The song and the, the, the prayer that it's based on, this, this song has been a stalwart for me since I first heard it several years ago. I've, I, I've sang this song and prayed the prayer and, and I've really meant it the best that I can. As a group, we sang the song in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem where, where Jesus, in his own agony, prayed for his Father's will to be done before he went to the cross. Do you know how powerful that was? I am yours, no longer my own. But who knows that some of these songs that we sing, it's a lot easier to sing them than it is to live them out, right? This was never more true for me than just over a year ago. It was back in early 2023 that I got the opportunity to come down and be a part of the pastoral team here at Grace Church. And listen, I have loved Grace Church for years. I love Southwest Florida. I loved the idea of living close to the beach. I loved the idea of no more snow. But I was pastoring an incredible growing congregation. It was a really sweet gig. We survived the pandemic together. Things were starting to go the right direction again. Our best friends were close by, literally minutes away. Our girls were in a great school with a great community around them. We were within re reasonable driving distance from my aging grandparents. The bottom line was this, we were really comfortable where we were. But what Paul is encouraging, what we read in the lyrics to the song in the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer, is that it's not about comfort. It's about following the faithful call of God. So when we had this opportunity, we had to wrestle, we had to pray, we, we met with the team here and ultimately came to this place where we surrendered to God's will. The, the night that I was uh, down here in Florida to meet with Pastor Wes for what would be the final yes or no, I sat in the parking lot of the Cape Coral campus in my rental car and I played this song that we're talking about today. I am yours no longer my own. Put me to whatever you will. Place me with whomever you choose. I am yours and you are mine. And since that yes to God's plan, I've experienced nothing but his faithfulness. It hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been smooth here at the Isle of Misfit Toys that we call Central Campus. July 1st marked one year of being one of your pastors, and in that year, I know, and my family knows, in, in, in that year, I know, and my family knows beyond any shadow of doubt that we are right where we're supposed to be for ministry and life. We're home here. He's faithful when we surrender to his call on our lives. Let's keep on with the second verse. I am yours, no longer my own, Raise me up or bring me low. It's getting harder. Use my all or lay me aside. I am yours and you are mine. 
There, there's that same theme again, it's surrender. Whether we're raised up or brought low, whether we're used fully for God or set aside, we remain his. And it's really this countercultural idea. We live in a world that's all about bigger and better, more and higher, position, prestige, and popularity. The prayer here is that God, if you wanna use me for something big and great, I'm here for it. If you want me to reach the stratosphere, I'm all in. And we're good with that part. It's the other part that gets us. God, if you want to bring me low, if you want to set me aside altogether and use someone else, I'm here for that too. That's what Paul's getting at in the second verse. He writes this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The world tells you that it's all about you, that it's all about advancing yourself. What it's really about knowing and responding to God's call, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And God's plans are still good and pleasing and perfect, even when life doesn't feel that way. There's a, there's a quote from famous columnist Irma Bombeck that I used to have framed on my office wall at a previous church, and it says this, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. That, that's the prayer here. God, whatever you want to use me for, I'm here for that. Raised high for you or brought low for you, I'm in it. Whether it means the highest of heights or becoming unknown, Becoming a Jesus-loving stranger in someone else's life, God, I will offer you everything I have. Everything. No matter the cost. A notable example of this is a woman named Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian who, along with her family, helped many, many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. She was a watchmaker uh, living in the Netherlands, and when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands, Corey and her family became involved in the Dutch resistance. They were hiding Jews in their home. They were helping them to escape. Their home became known as the hiding place, and it was a refuge for countless people. In 1944, the Ten Boom family was betrayed, and Corey, along with her sister Betsy and her father, were arrested. They were sent to concentration camps. Her father died shortly after his arrest, and Corey and Betsy were eventually sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany. In the midst of horrific conditions of the concentration camp, it would have been really easy for them to abandon their faith. Like, like after all, they had done so much for other people. How in the world could they now find themselves in this place? But Corey and Betsy held on to their faith, Despite the suffering around them, they managed to hold secret worship services with a smuggled in Bible. They brought hope and comfort to their fellow prisoners. Betsy's health started to deteriorate, and even in the midst of that, she remained steadfast in her belief that there was no pit so deep that God's love wasn't deeper still. Betsy died in that camp, and her last words to, to Corey were a reminder to continue to spread the message of forgiveness and love. And shortly after Betsy's death, Corey was released on a clerical error, which was miraculous because all the women her age were sent to the gas chamber shortly after. Corey returned to the Netherlands after the war. She was physically and emotionally scarred, but she was spiritually transformed. She set up rehabilitation centers for concentration camp survivors. She worked to promote healing and reconciliation. She traveled the world sharing her story and the message of forgiveness. She even met with and offered forgiveness to one of the concentration camp officers. Her, her life was a, after the war was a testament to the power of faith and forgiveness. She wrote several books, including The Hiding Place, which is a book that's inspired millions. Her work helped many people find peace and healing after the war. And her story to this day continues to be a powerful example of how our faith can bring transformation even in the darkest of times. Even in the pits of her own despair and suffering, she continued to offer herself to be used by God. How could she do that? Because she knew along with Paul, along with the song 
that we're talking about today, that surrendering to God's call sparks his transformative fire within us. And that's our big idea for today. It's on the screen. Would you say it with me? Surrendering fully to God's call sparks his transformative fire within us. Because here's the refrain of the Wesley prayer song. Come like a fire, burn in us. It's one of the earliest prayers of the church that just said, simply said, come Holy Spirit. It's that same prayer, come like a fire, burn in us. It's a powerful plea for God's refining fire to do what he wants to do in us, that the transformative power of the Holy Spirit would purify us and ignite our passions to be used for God's kingdom. The song continues, let me be full, let me be what? Empty. Let me have all things, let me have. Man, this song doesn't let up. It's the, the real grit of the prayer. This is the heart. Whether in abundance or need, we're called to trust in God's provision. What becomes the bridge of the song encapsulates the heart of the covenant prayer. Whether in abundance or need, we trust in God. I can be full, I can be empty, I can have everything or I could have absolutely nothing because absolutely nothing can change his love for me. I spent a lot of years climbing the ladder of success thinking that somehow I could prove myself to God, prove myself to others. And what I ended up learning was that I could lose it all. My home, my family, my job. And let me be clear, I don't wanna lose any of that, but I could. And if I did, even in that place, I would be just as loved by my Father in heaven as I am right now. They could take it all away, and he's still going to love me. You could lose everything, friends, and he still will love you just as much as he does right now. Isn't that a God worth offering yourself to? There is nothing that you could do to make God love you more than he does at this very moment. There's nothing you could do to, to make him notice you more. So though this part of the song and prayer sounds really hard, it's the secret sauce of the whole thing. Because you've got me, God. It's why Paul was able to say this elsewhere in his letter to the Philippians. He said, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's a declaration of complete trust and dependence on God no matter what comes our way. What is it that you need to say to God, I'm all in? I'm gonna trust you with this thing. Nearly 20 years ago now, and saying that I realize how old I'm getting, I feel, I felt called to go to college at a small Christian school in Illinois called Lincoln Christian College. I had other options for college, but I had this strong conviction that I was gonna get the best education and the most spiritually forming experience at Lincoln as I prepared for a life of ministry. There was only one problem. Lincoln was the most expensive option on my list. Between tuition, books, room and board, I couldn't make the math work. So I kept stringing along half committed to, to a couple of other more cost-effective options. And it just wasn't working for me. I'll never forget the day I had baseball practice after school. I know you're shocked that I was doing something related to baseball. And, and we were just doing batting practice that day. So I went first and then I went out and I pulled up my own corner of the outfield so I could just have some time to talk to Jesus. And I couldn't shake that feeling that God was with me in the feeling that I was supposed to go to Lincoln, but I also knew that I couldn't afford it. So I finally kind of angrily told God, fine, I'll do it your way. I'm going to fully commit to going to Lincoln Christian, but you've got to handle the finances. That afternoon, I got home and our answering machine was flashing. Now, if you're too young to know what an answering machine is, uh, it was this terrible thing we had back in the day that was a primitive form of voicemail that your whole family could hear the message that was left. If you don't believe me, Google it. Anyway, I was the first one home, so I pushed play on the messages. I listened to the stupid stuff my mom had on there. Uh, there was probably other few, but only one mattered. Larry, this is such and such calling from Lincoln Christian College to make sure you're aware of our brand new all-inclusive cost and scholarship program. 
All students enrolling this semester will receive tuition, books, room and board for no more than 10,000 a year. I don't know if you know anything about college, but that's cheap. I stood as a 17 year old in my parents' living room and wept like a baby. I surrendered to God's call even in the midst of great need and he was faithful. And I got to go to Lincoln, the place I knew I was supposed to go. What, where in your own life do you need to surrender to God's plan and call on your life, even if you can't clearly see how the details are going to work out? King David writes this in Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will what? Act. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. Committing ourselves to God isn't in vain. When we trust him with our lives, he promises to act on our behalf. The, the song that we've been looking at that we're gonna sing during communion captures this essence of trust and commitment and encourages us to surrender fully to God's call on our lives. So how do we live out this, this, this prayer, this song in our daily lives? Here's a few really practical steps. One, surrender daily. Begin each day with a prayer of surrender, asking God to use you according to his will. Trust that he knows what's best for you even when it's hard, even when it's challenging. It may even be that you, you take the prayer that this song is based on today and you pray it daily. And I'm gonna make that really easy for you. When you leave today, you're gonna get a card. And on one side of the card is the traditional version of the covenant prayer in the Wesley tradition. On the other side is the, the lyrics uh, to the song, how it was reimagined and if, you have a smartphone, you can scan this code and listen to the song whenever you want right on our Grace Church uh, website. So this can become embedded in your soul. Pray this prayer daily. I am no longer my own but yours. Sing this song with Jesus. Two, embrace transformation. Allow God to transform your mind and your heart through his word. Spend time in scripture, spend time in prayer, seeking his guidance and his wisdom. What is God asking you to surrender so that he can keep transforming you into a more fully devoted follower of Jesus? And three, serve willingly. Be open to opportunities to serve others, whether in your, our community or here at Grace Church or in your workplace, amongst your friends. Look for ways to bless those around you. And I have two of them right, right, right up front for you here that, so you don't have any excuses. Uh, we have an awesome opportunity coming up to make a meaningful impact in some of our community schools. We're calling it uh, Loving Our Schools. August 5th through 9th, our SIN ministries across Grace Church will be serving and supporting J. Collin English Elementary, Allen Park Elementary, that's in our neighborhood, Diplomat Middle School, Franklin Park Elementary is right here in our neighborhood and our own Small Wonders Preschool at the Cape Campus. We're gonna, we're gonna love on those, those, those kids and teachers and staff in all sorts of ways. We're gonna, we're gonna set up their classrooms for them. We're gonna volunteer at open house events. We're gonna provide meals. We're gonna offer encouragement to staff. And we'll have more information on that in the coming weeks or you can go to that website that you see up there and you can register right now. Another immediate opportunity is that our, our thrift store, the Second Chance Thrift Store. Uh, not only do we love, do we, do we share the love of Jesus with the customers who come in and owe the stories we could tell, but all of the funds that we raise in the thrift store come right back here to Central Campus to allow us to keep doing the ministries that we're doing. And you can sign up at guest services to help with that. Serve willingly. And finally, trust in God's call. Trust that God is working in and through you even when you don't understand it. His plans, his will, his call are good, pleasing, and perfect. Surrendering fully to God's plan will not always be easy. It may not make you famous, but it will bring about a transformation in you that makes you more like Jesus. Remember the call that Jesus gave to his first followers, Matthew 16. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must become rich and famous. No, it doesn't say that. You gotta have a huge social media following. No, it doesn't say that. If any of you wants to be my follower, what? You must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Following him is, is, is in our own self-denial and the, the song, the prayer encapsulates this by asking God to use us how he sees fit even when it's hard. 
It's a declaration of our willingness to follow Jesus no matter the cost. But the message is clear. When we fully surrender to God's call in our lives, whatever that looks like, God will transform us to be more like Jesus. In the art of pottery, there's this beautiful process that mirrors this journey in this song. It's about the surrender and transformation. A potter starts with a lump of clay. It's formless. It's unremarkable. The potter places the clay on a wheel and begins to spin it. With skilled hands, the the potter applies pressure, shaping the clay into something useful, something beautiful. But if the clay resists, if it hardens up too soon, the potter has to start all over again, reworking it until it's responsive to his touch. The potter's vision is always to create a vessel of purpose and beauty, but it requires the clay to be fully surrendered to the potter's hands. In the book of Jeremiah, God tells Israel, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. It's a powerful reminder of how God is trying to shape and transform us. And just like clay has to yield to the potter, we have to surrender to God's hands, trusting that he knows the design and purpose he has for us. So when you think about your life of following Jesus, are you resisting God's shaping Or are you fully surrendered to his hands, allowing him to mold you into something more beautiful? I am yours, no longer my own. I want to invite the the band to come back forward. And and in a moment, before we move to communion, we're going to read this covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition together. It's a prayer of complete surrender. And then during communion, we're going to sing the song I've been talking about. But first, as we prepare for communion, I want you to take a quiet moment to reflect on where it is that you might need to let go and trust yourself into God's hands for your life. Remember that the potter's hands are gentle and purposeful and always working for our good. Will you stand with me? And the words to the prayer are, are on the screen, and we're going to read this together. Let's pray. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Jesus established his covenant with us in this way. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would send the Holy Spirit right now to fall in this room as we sing this prayer, but also that the Holy Spirit would fall and transform these ordinary everyday elements of bread and juice truly into the body and blood of Jesus, that as we surrender ourselves fully to him, that we might be transformed and sent out to advance your kingdom. Let me be full Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. For those who are serving, come, and when they're ready, come forward and receive, and we're going to sing this prayer together.